Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another installment of City Lights Live, the virtual expression of the City Lights event series. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis, and tonight we are delighted to have back in the house Adam Schatz in conversation with Garnet Cadigan. We are celebrating the publication of the new book, The Rebels Clinic. The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. It's by Adam Schatz, and it's published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Before we begin, as is customary at the outset of each event, I would like to acknowledge we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homeland, the Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to take this moment to offer our respects to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. For those of us in the interest in anti-colonialism and social and racial justice, Franz Fanon is a figure of great significance. His writings about race, revolution, and the psychology of power continue to shape radical movements across the world, from Black Lives Matter to social injustice and liberation movements across the world. Fanon's thinking looms large in the minds of activists as well as academics. His writing has become canonical text of the Black and global radical imagination. What Adam Schatz has accomplished is to offer us a remarkable reconstruction of Fanon's extraordinary life, and also to present us with a guide to the books that inform present day efforts to challenge white supremacy and racial capitalism. Adam Schatz is the US editor of the London Review of Books and a contributor to the New York Times Magazine, the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, amongst other publications. He's also the host of the podcast, Myself with Others, and in 2023, New York Review Books published his collection of essays titled Writers and Missionaries, Essays on the Radical Imagination. Joining him tonight in conversation will be Garnet Cadigan. We've had the great pleasure of hosting Mr. Cadigan in the past. He is an essayist, journalist, and scholar. He is the Tunney Lee Distinguished Lecturer in Urbanism at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. Before we begin, I would like to remind you we're going to be posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard, of which you may purchase copies of the Rebels Clinic. We'll also be hosting a Q&A towards the end of the talk, so please do post your questions and comments in that same chat function. So please join us now in offering a warm welcome to Adam Schatz and Garnet Cadigan. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights. It's good to have you back with us. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back here. Wish it Thanks could be in so person, but always a joy to be at City Lights. Adam, congratulations. Thank you, Garnett. Yes, I, sp I enjoyed spending time with this book, as I'm sure those who haven't yet read it will. And you know, part of the beauty and the joy of this book is not only spending time with your mind unfolding across the page, but you know, Fanon's and the many different figures, political, uh, medical, um, intellectual, cultural, you know, who populate these pages. And so in many ways, it's not merely a book about Fanon, but it's a book very much about his era, our era, you know, why he still has such strong resonance to us now, and particularly the variety of strands of thoughts and the figures, you know, who kept, you know, moving in and out, you know, of his life and in, in his work. The introduction gave us a good sense as to why the broad appeal now, but I'd still like you to unpack some more, which you've done in the book, you know, you know, what is it about Fanon, but also what is it about us that explains Fanon's broad appeal today? Well, I mean, I think Fanon, you know, Fanon partly owes his appeal to the fact that he had this very cinematic life. I mean, he was someone who uh, came from this uh, from this small island from from Martinique, who uh, was a child of the empire, um, who very much absorbed uh, the ideology of the French Republic, uh, liberty, equality and fraternity. Um, who saw the ways in which that was betrayed. And then um, after fighting for France in the Second World War, uh, turned against France, fought against France uh, in Algeria, where he'd gone originally as a kind of a colonial administrator running a psychiatric hospital in uh, the, the Bleed Adjoinville Psychiatric Hospital outside of um, just outside of Algiers. So, um, you know, and then of course, you know, he ends up in Tunis, he becomes a spokesman for Algeria's liberation movement, the FLN. And um, by 1958, he's posted to Accra um, as the FLN's traveling ambassador in what was then called Afrique Noire, or Black Africa. So, and then he dies, you know, in 1961 of leukemia. So, you know, here you have this very short, you know, brutally, you know, abbreviated life um, of a man who was uh, very literary and intellectual in, in his preoccupations, but who was also, um, 
you know, a man of action, uh, you know, an, an, uh, an, an intellectual engagé, a committed intellectual um, in the Sartrean uh, mold. And there is something very um, intriguing um, about a character like that. And what's more, there's something I think quite arresting about, uh, in this case, you know, an intellectual from the West Indies, a, a black French intellectual psychiatrist who aligns himself with a national liberation movement very far from home. Um, he joins a Muslim led liberation uh, uh, organization in Algeria um, of all places. He isn't remaining in his lane, so to speak. Um, he is aligning himself with a people to whom in some sense he doesn't belong, but with whom he has this very strong identification. So um, I do think that the dramatic arc of Fanon's life uh, partly accounts uh, for his enduring aura. But, you know, it's it's also, uh, I think, attributable to the force and power uh, of his writing um, in his three major books, Black Skin, White Masks, which was published in 1952 when he was 27 years old, um, a study of racism, particularly the, the, um, the psychological impact uh, of racism um, on... Uh, above all on West Indians. Um, uh, his second book uh, was uh, A Dying Colonialism, published in 1959 under the title Year Five of the Algerian Revolution. And then finally, his, 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 um, his great manifesto, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, published in December 1961, as Fanon lay dying in a hospital bed in, you know, of all places, Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and, you know, these books... Uh, convey uh, kind of un what, what I'm calling kind of the the, the, um, the dream life of racism and colonialism, the way that these um, forces of oppression are lived, the way they're internalized, the way they impact individual souls and bodies. Um, and he does so with, uh, with a force and intensity uh, uh, with a kind of, um, with a visceral effect and also with with great analytical analytical prowess i think in a way that very few other writers of the time did i mean there were others who uh rivaled fanon like albert memi the tunisian jewish intellectual with whom he nearly but did not quite uh, cross paths uh, he was also a follower of sartre who published a very influential book called the colonizer and the colonized in 1957 but um you, you didn't become a revolutionary reading Mami, whereas many people became revolutionaries after reading Fanon. There's something uh, electrifying um, about the work, and uh, I think that current of energy still pulsates through it. You speak about you know, his commitment to thinking about you know, the body um, and also to the psyche, that he, you know, here he was you know, at once, you know, in a, to use the expression, you know, in a in a hands and heart, you know, thinking very much, you know, you know, what's the effect of racism, you know, on us psychologically, but also, you know, how do the structures, you know, of colonialism, of racism, you know, of oppression, you know, affect our very bodies, you know, in a physiologically, and you unravel that in the book, um, in a part of it is, you know, how he, you know, comes into, you know, you know, you know, these understandings and these grapplings and the way in which he was working it through, not merely in these three books he spoke about, but also in himself, you know, and listen himself as part of a struggle. And so, you know, came, say something more about that, about that. He came, he came into an awareness of that partly through his own, uh, through his own personal experience. I mean, you know, it's important to remember that Fanon uh, grew up uh, in Martinique in the 1920s. He was born in 1925. Um, and he grew up thinking of himself as just another French person. Um, this was a common illusion among um, Martinicans of color of a particular social class. I mean, he was um, uh, he was from a middle class family. Um, his father was a customs inspector. Uh, his parents were great believers in the French Republic. They were French socialists. Um, and uh, Fanon, as it were, you know, Fanon drank the Kool Aid. Um, and and in, in fact, you could argue that even when Fanon turned against France and Algeria. Uh, he did so in the in the name and sense of of, of French ideals, uh, of French Republican ideals. He was, you know, as C.L.R. James put it, um, a black Jacobin. 
Um, so, you know, Fanon uh, has this, um, you know, this shattering experience um, not long after the Second World War. Um, in which he served in the Free French Forces. You know, he 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 joins the Free French Forces when he's 19 years old, 1944, and and realizes early on in Morocco, where he under, where he um, does his military training, that this that this French army, which has been organized by De Gaulle to fight fascism, is a colonial army, um, and he is seen as a European in it because he's West Indian. But the Arabs and the Africans are treated very differently. Um, they face discrimination. They're they're treated as less than human in a way. And uh, uh, Fanon, uh, of course, ends up taking part in the, this you know in an invasion of France in um, 1944. He's wounded. He gets the Croix de Guerre. But then um, uh, you know Fanon finds that no that a French woman aren't going to dance with him. You know they'd prefer to dance with an American or a white soldier. And um, uh, that's difficult enough for him to accept because he fought to liberate their country from fascism, uh, a country that he thought of as his own country, right? The metropole was his own country. Um, and then uh, not long after that, he's he's in Paris and he's in the metro. That's presumably in Paris because in Lyon, where he studied, didn't have a functioning metro system. He's in Paris and this little boy um, spots him and says to his mother, you know, look, Mama, un nègre. Uh, you know, I'm frightened. And he and he begins to to look at himself in the way that, let's say, another person would look at it. He's he's objectified. Um, he's transformed into this object of both fascination and fear. And Fanon becomes aware that he is associated in this boy's imagination. This boy being already a kind of racial expert at five or six, he's associated with things like cannibalism, with forces of darkness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with the jungle, you know, and um, Fanon realizes at that point that, no, I'm not seen as a Frenchman in the eyes of these French people. I'm actually seen as a black man. And um, and and that experience is a is not just an intellectual one. It's a corporeal one. He talks about feeling spread eagled um, on this, you know, in this day of mourning. Um, uh, uh, he uh, talks about feeling almost paralyzed. And then he talks about the um the reactions that form within him a desire for violence um in black skin white masks he draws upon examples from black american literature to explain the sensations that he undergoes at that time he cites for example um the figure of bigger thomas in uh in richard wright's um, native son he's looking for examples of a kind of um of a kind of fury you know in the face of racism a fury that feeds into um, into, rec into self recognition, and so um, you know, Fanon is always aware of both the intellectual, psychological, and corporeal dimensions of what he calls the lived experience um, of the black man, l'expérience vécue du noir, which is the central chapter in Black Skin uh, White Masks. So it's clear that it. That identification, you know, you said it a few times that mm -hmm. you know, he's self-defining through identification with others. You know, he's identifying with, um, you know, you know, African Americans. He's identified, um, in you know, in with you know, in a in know, Arabs and you know, in a blacks in in Algeria and elsewhere. And well, not black, not blacks in Algiers because there really weren't any blacks in Algiers. Yeah. There, were, there were black people in no, the South. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he's fashioning, as it were, you know, his new sense of himself by identifying with others. And it's it strikes me there's an irony running through like you know, you know, one of the beauties of the book is you know how it shot through the irony. Maybe it's my love for you know irony and you know it opens up you know these tensions or these struggles. Um uh, and one of the ironies is you know how he so often at least you know, looking at him, you know, you know, from our current perspective, so often identified, you know, with causes, which is, you know, causes, you know, that as it were, he adopted, you know, you know, he, you know, began to find ways of defining himself by, you know, identifying with others, and he's getting it from literature. He's, um, you know, you know, pulling, you know, stuff from femme, you know, as a lover of femme, he's pulling, you know, you know, from conversation with a variety of thinkers, and you see him, you know, identifying people in in Angola, in Algeria, in elsewhere. So you know how is this son of the Antilles 
in, in a, as it were, you know, reshaping or redefining himself by identifying with others. And and how does he go about doing right. that? I mean, I mean, I do, I, yeah, I mean, I do think that to some extent, I mean, it's one theme in the book, uh, among others, that, that Fanon's life is a kind of search for a, sen a stable sense of belonging and identity. It's not the only theme that resounds in his life, but 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 it's an important one. Um, Fanon, um, I think, had an ambivalent relationship to his West Indian origins. Um, and that's very clear um, if you read Black Skin, White Masks. Um, uh, people uh, tend to remember Black Skin, White Masks as a critique of racism, which it is. But it's also a scathing critique of, um, of West Indians um, who have um, accepted and continue to wear uh, this white mask and who continue to aspire um, to what he calls the supremacy of white values. And um, Fanon grounds this, this acceptance um, in, 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 a, in a narrative of the history of Martinique, uh, Guadeloupe, and Réunion, the, the French Antilles, which he sees as very distinct uh, from the history of Haiti. In Haiti, there had been this great uh, slave revolt uh, led by Toussaint Louverture, you know, the, the one revolt that, that led to independence um, in, in, the West, in, in the French West Indies. Uh, by comparison, by contrast, uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Réunion um, had, um, um, had been, quote unquote, granted abolition in 1848 um, uh, thanks to um, uh, Victor Shelsher, you know, the, the architect of, of, of abolition. Now, Fanon uh, wasn't really aware of the fact that in Martinique there had been slave uprisings. Uh, none had, had been as large or as successful um, as the one in Haiti, but the, um, his ancestors were not, were not docile. They didn't passively accept slavery. But that was Fanon's perception. Fanon's, Fanon's perception was that the Martinicans had basically accepted their fate. They hadn't fought against it. And in 1848, they had been given like a kind of gift from the white man, a freedom which could only be a spurious and false freedom because they actually, because they hadn't fought for it. You know, Fanon was, um, was very much a, a Hegelian. Rather, he was a someone who had, um, uh, in who had uh, been very influenced by a particular reading of of Hegel that the friend, that the philosopher Alexandre Kojève had given in his seminars in the 1930s, and essentially this reading had taken a chapter from Hegel about the Lord and the bondsman, and had injected it with a kind of Marxist politics, and had seen the struggle between the Lord and the bondsman as a as a as a kind of precursor to a modern class struggle. Um, and so for Fanon, there was no freedom unless you'd fought for it. And so he looked upon Martinique with a with a mixture, with a kind of ambivalence and even a kind of shame. Um, in 1953, after he'd finished his medical studies and after he'd written uh, Black Skin, White Masks, after he had done his residency at the great pioneering uh, asylum, the Saint Alban Clinic, where he learned so many of his methods of, of therapy, of disalienation, uh, Fanon had, had to decide where he was going to go. Well, he was very certain that he was not going to go back to Martinique. He did not want to go back to Martinique. He did not want to go back to the islands. Um, he wrote to Leopold Senghor, the Senegalese poet and statesman, to see if he might go to Senegal, but he never heard back from Senghor, who... Um, you know, once you know, one wonders: Did did Songor read Black Skin White Mask? Because it's it's very dismissive of Songor, who had been an early enthusiasm of of Fanon in France, and whom Fanon had kind of turned against sarcastically. So he was casting about for a place to go, and uh, in nineteen fifty late nineteen fifty three, he was he was um, appointed the uh, director of the Blida Joinville um, Psychiatric Hospital um, in Algeria. It hadn't been his decision to go to Algeria to take part in a revolution. There, there was no revolution in Algeria. Um, uh, the FLN uh, would only launch its insurrection 11 months later. But, you know, Fanon wanted to go somewhere else. 
He did not want to stay in the islands. And so he ends up in Algeria, in this place that he'd only visited once. It was a place that he passed through during the Second World War on his way to France. And when he was there, he had been struck by the sight of poor, malnourished children. Um, in black skin, white masks, he um, refers uh, to the Algerian con colonial condition. Um, he had also, in Lyon, worked with North African laborers who were sending remittances home. And these were mostly Algerian men who were sleeping six or seven to a room, who were, you know, living the most um, marginal of lives, um, uh, cut off from their families, cut off from French society, and yet who were told at the, at the very same time that they were French because, you know, the fiction of Algeria, French Algeria, was that Algeria was France. It had been... It had been conquered in the, you know, from 1830 through the 1870s. In 1848, it was divided into three administrative departments of France. Algeria was France. And yet, clearly, the Algerians were not French. And Fanon understood this. And I think that you know, he was very struck and very shaped by his work with Algerians um, in France. In fact, uh, his work had inspired one of his early articles, a path-breaking piece called The North African Syndrome, in which he first lights on the idea that uh, uh, that social segregation and racism can produce um, uh, even physical effects um, of illness. Um, and when he gets to Algeria, uh, he becomes fascinated by the Algerians. He starts to go to the countryside, to Kabylie, to the Bled, the so-called outback. He's watching possession ceremonies. He's observing with growing admiration the way that Algerians treat the mentally ill. And Fanon writes in one of his medical papers that unlike European doctors who tend to judge the sufferer, the mentally ill person, um, as if that mentally ill person were responsible for his or her illness, uh, the North Africans, the Algerians, treat the mentally ill um, very kindly because they don't blame the mentally ill. They blame the jinn. They blame the genie that has taken possession of that person. And um, and so, you know, Fanon is becoming captivated by this people. And I think one of the things that he sees in the Algerians, and again, I want to suggest in this book, I do suggest in this book that there's a more than a whiff of romanticism to it. What he sees is a people who have refused the mask. They're not like the West Indians he's grown up with. They're not seeking to kind of prove who's more white than the next person. I, I'm not, by the way, I'm not endorsing this view of, of um, Martinique and society. I'm just, I'm simply reflecting what Fanon's rather heated perception of it was. But he came to believe that the Algerians had stuck to their culture, had remained resilient, had refused to become French, even under the most brutal of conditions. And so when the rebellion breaks out in November 1954, Fanon doesn't take long to decide which side he stands on. In fact, weeks after the rebellion breaks out, he offers his services to the Algerians and says, I want to fight with you. But of course, he doesn't fight with them despite his past as a soldier, he ends up creating this clandestine clinic um, and becoming a doctor to the Algerians and a doctor to the Algerian wounded um, and, and a counselor to them. So his, you know, his attraction, I think, has much to do with this relationship to West India, to the West Indies. And I think that it also has something to do with um, his emerging belief that the Algerian struggle represented a kind of universal struggle for freedom, for equality, a struggle for dignity in the face of oppression. He um, invested great hopes in the Algerian movement. Um, it was not simply a struggle for Algerian nationhood and independence. For Fanon, it represented something much more. So how did his romanticism, as you mentioned, his romanticism, you know, open up um, different tensions within his thought, within his thinking, because in a in a there is, you know, in a Fernande psychiatrist, and it's you know, in many ways, in a in a he starts as a critic, you know, of the medical establishment, which itself, you know, in a leads in in, you know, powerful ways to him being a critic of the political, um, in a conditions um, and the establishment, um, but there is a romanticism which you 
you know, in wrestler word in the book. I keep using that word wrestler, um, you know, because there is in a in a, a struggle that he's participating in outside, but there's also, you know, what seems like a, if not a struggle, a tension, um, you know, within you know the proclivities um of Fanon or you know, in his thought or you know tensions between his thought and some of the actions um you know you know that he's drawn to or that he suggests. And so I wonder, you know, you know, for you, um, you know, how do you see the romanticism, as it were, you know, in a bolstering um the way he thinks, maybe as well, it were, it, well, it, romanticism it, or right, undermining I mean, the way he thinks. Yeah, I mean it it does well less. I mean, I think that it works in various ways. I mean, for one thing, it's it's yes, it's a, it's a romanticism, but it's also enabling. I mean, it's it's you know, that romanticism enables Fanon to do what he does, which is quite extraordinary. It enables him to put himself forward as um, as a as a doctor and a thinker and ultimately as a spokesman for this cause and to play this galvanizing role. I mean, he's not setting policy; he's not making any kind of decisions for the Algerian movement, but he plays a, a rather high profile and charismatic role in it. And I think that without that um, that romanticism, even without that illusion, I'm not sure that he could have. Um, and so I don't want to entirely dismiss it. I mean, I think that there's something um, rather grand and rather appealing about it, even if it hasn't necessarily worn well in other respects, worn well analytically. Um, I mean, the tensions in Fanon are, are fascinating because, um, and the tensions are certainly um, uh, very much part of the engine of, of the narrative in this book. I mean, there are uh, tensions between- uh, This book, by this book you mean? My book. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the Rebels Clinic. I mean, yes. uh, there are tensions between Fanon as psychiatrist and healer, and Fanon as um, as advocate of violence and and um, an armed struggle. I mean, in some ways, healing and armed struggle, you know, perhaps arguably work in tandem. But but there are also some serious conflicts between them, and Fanon becomes quite aware of them. And I mean, this is one of the reasons that. Uh, the Wretched of the Earth begins with this um, chapter about the psychological necessity of violence uh, for the colonized, given that they are um, they have been rendered strangers um, in their own home, given that they are living in a world that has been created by immense violence that um, has led to their 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 subjugation, their dehumanization. Um, for them, violence is an affirmation of humanity, of the will to resist. Um, and yet at the same time, um, he's aware that that um, certain kinds of violence um, are likely to leave a, a lasting um, and negative effect um, and to weigh very heavily on the uh, future of um, post-independence Algeria and other countries that have fought for their liberation. And that's the subject to the last chapter of the book, uh, Colonial War and Mental Disorders. And th those chapters exist in a productive and, and unresolved tension. And my, my own sense is that, you know, Fanon came up with this argument about the therapeutic benefits of, um, of violence, um, the way in which violence, um, as he saw it, would free the colonized from feelings of futility, of impotence, of weakness, of despair. He came up with this argument in spite of, you know, I think some reasons that he might have had to be skeptical in the long term. Um, as a kind of myth, and I, when I say myth, I, I mean it in the in the sense of Claude Levi Strauss, and Levi Strauss um, defines myth as a kind of narrative um, that um, is created to symbolically resolve um, contradictions that can't be resolved in reality. Um, violence was, in many ways, necessary. In a, in a country like French Algeria, which was under the boot of um, this, this extremely powerful um, French military um, supported by, by, um, by European um, colonists, um, a country where all the efforts by Algerians to pursue peaceful reform had been scuttled, often violently. So 
inevitably violence would have some place in a movement uh, for social transformation. And yet it was also clear that, um, that violence was going to uh, result in anguish, not just physical, but psychological, and that um, it would imperil Algeria's future in some ways. Um, and so how do you resolve that tension, the necessity of violence and also the, the clear damage that a reliance on armed struggle would ultimately cause? You resolve it um, with this narrative of the therapeutic benefits of violence. I don't want to suggest that Fanon is even doing this consciously, but I, I do think that it emerges out of some recognition on his part that um, that there was this inevitable tension or contradiction uh, between these two practices, his practice as a psychiatrist and his practice as a militant. Um, and we could talk about other, certainly other tensions um, in Fanon's character. Um, but I see him as, I mean, I think that, you know, unfortunately there's been a tendency to see Fanon either as this, um, this villain. Um, and you see that a bit, even in some of the reviews of my book where Fanon is, you know, described as this, is really reduced to a champion of violence and at times even characterized as someone who was himself personally violent um, on the basis of very, very, very slender evidence um, uh, that I myself didn't encounter in my research or in my conversations with people who knew him very well. There's a need and a kind of desire to see Fanon as violent. I mean, it's remarkable to me that the most incendiary line in The Wretched of the Earth wasn't written by Fanon. It was written by Sartre in his preface. Um, to kill a European is, to, is for the colonized, is to kill two birds with one stone, the, the, oppre the oppressor and the man who oppresses, and that the person who carries out this killing emerges a new man and a better man. Fanon didn't write that, Sartre did. But we don't tend to think of Sartre as this violent man. And yet in some of the reviews, okay, Sartre <laughs> appears as this, you know, as this, this, this violent man, this, this, you know, as a, you know, the man who slaps his wife, his white wife, you know, he's, he's Othello, he's O.J. Simpson. I mean, there's a racial unconscious, I think, expressed in some of these characterizations. Um, uh, Fanon wrote about a great number of things uh, besides violence. You know, he wrote very trenchantly um, about the suffering of the colonized. He wrote about culture. He wrote about nationalism. He wrote about the shape of post-independence regimes, and yet he's reduced to this violent stereotype. And one of the reasons that I dwell on these tensions and these struggles within Fanon and on the, I think, overlooked ambiguities and nuances in his writing is that I want to do justice to Fanon as a man and a thinker of complexity. Um, and, you know, Fanon writes in Black Skin, White Masks that all that he really wanted was to be seen as a man, nothing but a man, yet somehow that 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 um, rather modest ambition, um, that modest aspiration eluded him, and so you know this book to some extent is an attempt to restore that complexity. To that end of trying to seem as a man, one of the things the book does and does well, very well, is showing his thought emerging from relationships. Um, you know, whether it be as a psychiatrist, his relationship with patients, um, or his relationship with in a, in a colleagues um, in a, in disagreement, his relationship with uh, in a political thinkers, his relationship with writers, his relationship with you know, neighbors, passersby, and one of the rich relationships that you delineate in the book is a relationship with his secretary. Um, you know who wrote um, his books. Um, you know who, um, in many ways, in a, in a new in a, in a fan and in ways that you know almost you know no one else did and I'd like you before discussing in you know, a her and you know his thought in you know, a his um uh, thinking coming out of um relationships and the to and fro of relationships let's dip into the book for a second to sure, give people sure, sure, feel sure. for your pros but also feel for that relationship and sure, sure. 
Sure. Um, the woman you're referring to is someone I got to know a few years before she died. Her name was Marie-Jeanne Manuelon. She was a, a French woman from, from, from the Corrèze, from the, south, the southwest of France. Her father was a resistance uh, activist who stored weapons. She used to joke that he was, um, he was a terrorist. Um, and uh, Fanon would say to her that um, the Corrèze is for you what Martinique is for me. And what he meant was a place that was extremely important in memory, but a place that she could never really return to. Um, she married a Tunisian Armenian man, engineer named uh, Gilbert Manuelon. They were communists um, in the 1940s. And when the, at the time of the Khrushchev revelations, they were horrified by what they learned about Stalin about the gulag and so on and uh they uh broke with the party they left the party and they found another source of hope um in the decolonization struggles the liberation struggles in what was then called the third world and so they, they went back to they went to Tunisia where Gilbert had grown up and she began working with poor Tunisian women and eventually she got this job working um at um with Fanon um in his clinic um, as his secretary. And at first, their relations were quite chilly. She was frightened of Fanon. Fanon um, was very cold towards her. Um, and she she described him to her husband as the sadist. But eventually, um, Fanon took an interest in her. Um, he took an interest in her partly because he noticed that one of his colleagues was curious about Marie-Jeanne Manuelon. She was a very strong, very forceful woman, very um, outspoken. Um, and she became kind of a protege of his as well. Um, she started to learn about psychoanalysis, which, you know, which, which the communist party had regarded with um, disdain as a so-called bourgeois science. And Fanon told her, no, you really need to read Freud. You need to read Lacan. You need to, you know, learn about psychoanalysis. And eventually after the war, she went back to school, studied psychoanalysis, and eventually became a, a social worker, a trained social worker. So she she owed much of her later trajectory to um, her experiences with Fanon. I'm gonna read a, a passage about, um, about their relationship. There's a reference at one point to a man named Abdelafi Boussoff, and um, I'm just gonna explain who he is before. Um, he was a uh, he was the head of Alg the uh, FLN's intelligence services, and he was the second most powerful person um, in the Algerian movement um, in Tunis. The, the most powerful person was the Colonel Houari Boumedian, who became Algeria's leader in a military coup in 1965. And Abdel, Abdel, Abdel Boussaf um, uh, essentially um, spied on everyone who was involved in the movement um, and kept a tight lid on anyone who was involved um, uh, in the FLN. Um, and eventually uh, the intelligence services that Abdulafid Boussaf uh, created became the spinal cord of the post-war, the post-independence um, Algerian state. Uh, and in fact, uh, it still is um, uh, much to the country's detriment. Um, so uh, this is about a night that the Fanons and the Manuelons went out. This is Franz Fanon and his wife, Josie, who was a, who was a journalist, French woman, and uh, Marie-Jeanne Manuelon and her husband, Gilbert. One night in 1959, the Fanons and the Manuelons went to see Alain René's new film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, at the Rotonde, near the Cathedral of Saint-Vincent de Paul. Fanon, who suffered from myopia but refused to wear glasses because he found them to be an encumbrance, insisted on sitting in the front row. Josie declared that she wasn't going to ruin her eyes and sat farther back, leaving Marie-Jeanne beside Fanon. In René's film, Emmanuel Riva plays an actress who's come to Hiroshima to make a film about the impact of the bomb. There she falls for a Japanese man and finds herself flooded with memories of the war when she had an affair with a German soldier a clandestine relationship that led to her humiliating punishment, the public shaving of her hair at the liberation. Fanon asked Marie-Jeanne what she made of the film. She replied that its treatment of trauma and repression reminded her of psychoanalysis. To forget her experience, she explained, Riva's character must first remember and name it. What's repressed is something we can't remember, Manuelon said, and yet the repressed is there, alive, but only in our dreams. She compared the experience of 
suppression to the amputation of a part of oneself. Fanon, who had always been drawn to the metaphor of amputation and phantom limbs, was overjoyed by her explanations. He said to me, you make me happy. I've taught you something. Fanon also loved the film, but in Manuelon's view, it resonated with him for another reason. Its depiction of what he called contingent or parallel love, a somewhat grand philosophical term for the kind of dalliances that Sartre and Beauvoir both permitted themselves, so long as those dalliances were not a threat to their own enduring bond. Fanon believed that jealous people were dangerous paranoids, and that jealousy was an evil to be eliminated so that humans could be truly adults. At one dinner at the Manuelon's apartment, Fanon said he hoped to be able to approach a man and say, I'd like to share a slice of life with your wife if she's in agreement, without this having any effect on what binds me to my wife or what binds you to yours. It doesn't take away anything from you. On the contrary, it's a gain, since no one is anyone else's property. Everyone can live in liberty. Everyone is the sole, prop is the sole proprietor of their freedom. This isn't easy, but this is true love. Did he encourage Josie to pursue her own parallel loves? Marie-Jeanne didn't say, but Josie seems to have taken a lover, an official in the FLN, when her husband's absences grew more frequent. We were all as serious as he was, Manuel Long recalled, weighing the pros and cons while peeling our blood oranges at the table. Josie defended her husband's position while the others objected that not everyone could be Sartre and Beauvoir. Fanon replied that contingent love was in any case impossible now to put into practice. We need to make the revolution first. Fanon never, appro never approached Gilbert with such a proposal, but an attraction, if not a parallel love, had begun to stir between the doctor and his secretary. Marie-Jeanne did not find him handsome, but, quote, he was naturally elegant and seductive, and one day her hand accidentally brushed against his cheek. His skin was warm, and Fanon responded to her touch, embracing her. They went to a hotel, but as soon as they arrived, he hesitated and said he could not go in. Why? Because I am black, he replied, meaning that he would inevitably be seen and noticed, quite possibly, by one of Abdelafid Boussouf's spies in the so-called mobile brigades. They were all being watched, Marie-Jean recalled, and he could not take that risk. It was not a question of power. He had none but he didn't want his reputation to be sullied. They made one more attempt a few weeks later when they got into a car and drove to, the, to a friend's empty house in La Marsa, to which Fanon had keys. We didn't even have time to take off our clothes when there was a knock on the door, Manuel Lan recalled. It was the gardener. They took the interruption as an omen and drove home. Manuel Lan told me they'd never had an affair, but added mischievously that even if they had, she would never reveal the secret. Whether or not a relationship ever materialized, a collaboration did. Fanon spoke his books. Marie-Jeanne Manuelon, his tape recorder, was the first to write them down. Well, thanks, Adam. Yeah, so there's, you know, Fanon, the man. Um, and as you think of, I mean, we're going to get to questions and I'm going to open the questions, but I wanted to open, you know, by we spent so much time talking about Fanon the critic and how Fanon has been reading other things, you know, how he reads his times, how he reads um, other writers, how he, you know, reads femme, um, you know, read in a, in a myth, in a cultural artifact. But what's especially interesting in a, in a now, in, in this moment, you know, with you know, this especially renewed interest in Fanon is how we read Fanon, you know, which you've spoken to that, you know, we so sure. often read him in a, in a, in a narrowly in and reduce him to a dichotomy. And in in one line in the book, you know, you know, you mentioned in, a, in a, that the political vision was catastrophist, and I reckon there's a particular group of people who been drawn to that catastrophist vision. Um, but then also there is in a in a Fanon the, the idealist, um, in a, and in a utopian visionary. You know, one person has asked, you know, you know, what might we think, you know, you know how you know Fanon, you know, would you know, honest and Afro-pessimism, you know, what would you think of Afro-pessimism? And I'm, you know, asking that question, but tacking it on to the other question in, in, in how we, you know, read Fanon now, um, you know, what are the ways in which we come to Fanon, as it were, to, to in, in our deliberation, to, as it were, weigh in on some of the, sure. I mean, to take the, the question of, ideas of the day. Right, I mean, to take the question of Afro-pessimism, um, I, I write about this a bit in the epilogue, and, um, and there's no question, of course, that that, that Afro pessimist philosophers, who are a, a variegated group of people, they're they're not all saying the same thing. 
Um, there are different iterations of Afro-pessimism, but let's say that broadly speaking, Afro-pessimism uh, does draw some inspiration uh, from Fanon of a particular, and in, in my view, selective kind, which doesn't, which isn't to say that it's not in its own way Fanonian. There are, you know, my purpose in in writing this book is not to claim that there's one correct reading of Fanon. I'm, I, you know, suggest in the last chapter of the book that you know Fanon's um, uh, future as a as a as a writer lies in his specters. It's not in you know, in a single interpretation. But um, the historical Fanon, I think, would have found uh, Afro-pessimism a bit perplexing. Um, Afro-pessimism tends to um, dwell on isolated passages um, in black skin, white masks, particularly um, Fanon's line about the, the about, about blackness um, as a kind of arid zone of of, of non-being that 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 can achieve a kind of dialectical fulfillment and you know Fanon um was trying to I think to convey um uh, you know the the despair um that is part of uh, the black condition in a white majority society but he did not regard this as a as an ontological condition he regarded it as a social political um, an historical one. And, um, you know, if you actually finish the book, you find that uh, that Fanon believes very much in new departures and believes that it is possible to overcome this this arid uh, zone um, of, of non-being. He doesn't see it as something that um, one is condemned to. Um, uh, social and political practice um, can change the state of affairs um, that we've inherited. Um, for Afro-pessimists, uh, Fanon's writing after Black Skin, White Masks is in some ways a, a deviation if not, uh, from his original um, intentions and, and arguably even a betrayal. Um, Frank Wilderson, for example, a well-known Afro-pessimist, um, has, I think, characterized Fanon's decision to embrace the Algerian struggle um, as a betrayal of Fanon's commitment to Black liberation. Um, but, um, you know, in my view, uh, uh, Fanon's decision to support the Algerian struggle was very much um, a logical continuation of the beliefs that he expressed in um, Black Skin, White Masks, where, you know, it's worth recalling his highest praise is reserved not for negritude, you know, um, the negritude of Sangor or, or of Aimé Césaire, whom he preferred, uh, but for the Viet Minh, for the rebels against French colonialism. There's a famous line in Black Skin, White Mass that's often quoted about how people only begin to revolt when they can no longer breathe. But what those who quote it often forget is that what Fanon says is that um, when the Viet Minh revolted, they did so not in defense of a culture, and that's a swipe at negritude with its search for a kind of usable past. They didn't They didn't do so to defend a culture or to reclaim a culture. They did so because they could no longer breathe. They went into action. They took up arms. Uh, Fanon is above all uh, a person, a man of action. And so um, while I think that Afro-pessimism is evocative of certain texts, a certain um, uh, passages um, in, Fanon, in Fanon. Well, I think that it is um, uh, a very powerful mood, um, uh, kind of cultural mood that that reflects an understandable um, sense of um, really a sense of of despair about the potential for for political change um, in America um, under white supremacy. Um, I, I don't think that, um, that Afro-pessimism is particularly faithful, um, to the historical Fanon. Now, Fanonism is a different matter. I mean, it is, it is a, an iteration of Fanonism. And so are the various other iterations, um, which you'll find being expressed by other thinkers and other groups. I mean, for, you know, I mean, I mean, in a sense, you know, Fanon, um, you know, like 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 Marx, like Freud, um, uh, he comes to be associated with certain, you know, certain slogans, certain um, certain signature passages um, in the work. So, you know, Freud gets reduced to 
the unconscious or the edible complex, Marx to the class struggle. And in the case of Fanon, it's to, you know, armed struggle, or let's say um, in the case of Afro-pessimism, blackness as this arid state, arid zone of non-being. You, you've answered this already, so it feels unfair to ask it to you again, but I'd like to go through a side door that you haven't been through with it yet. And it's part of what you're doing is inviting us to read Fanon differently. You know, you mentioned the epilogue. Actually, you know, one of the things that's funny um, about the book, um, it implicitly suggests that part of the issues that we have with Fanon is actually not going past the first chapter or maybe the second chapter of his books that many people have cherry picked from Wretched of the Earth or, you know, um, Black Skin White Mask rather than making it to the end. But to make it to the end of your book um, is to recognize you're asking us not merely to read, you know, Fanon um, differently or attentively, but to also read his times, read his interlocutors, um, read his critics, uh, um, you know, you know, read not merely the books that he was reading. He didn't read not merely his books, but the books, you know, um, he was reading and to you know, you know, to give sustained, respectful, uh, thoughtful attention, um, and embrace um him in 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 his in his complexities and contradictions. I mean, Fanon is Fanon is Fanon is a great soloist. There's no question. He's yes. a great. He's a he's a virtuoso violinist. But you really got to understand who the other people in the orchestra are. Yeah, and so this is what I wanted to ask. You know, in a in, I mean, we'll see it in the book, but. I'd love for you to just say to us, like, you know, who are some of the thinkers or um, some of the strains of thought that that most drew you um, or that you wanted most to draw us into, into engaging with, into, you know, you know, thinking alongside, into, you know, maybe arguing with, um, yeah. enriched by as you as you worked on this book. Well, I wanted to see Fanon in relation to uh, the thinkers and activists and militants who were responding to some of the same problems that he was and who, you know, shared his desire uh, to overthrow the structures of colonial and racial domination, but who also, you know, again, like Fanon, wanted to put something better um, in their place. I think that last part is often forgotten today. I mean, it, when Fanon wrote in 1961, he knew that the colonial empires were falling. That was a no brainer. You know, decolonization was a foregone conclusion. The, the key question for Fanon was, well, what's going to come after? Are these new governments going to improve upon these wretched colonial regimes? How do we how do we um, uh, avoid repeating their mistakes? How do we avoid reproducing the very structures of colonial domination without the colonizer even being present? Um, and there were other thinkers who were addressing themselves to these problems and also to questions of you know, to strat questions of strategy. Sometimes they disagree with Fanon. And I'm thinking of people like um, the Algerian historian, Mohammed Harbi, who was in the FLN uh, mm -hmm. and who knew Fanon in, in Tunis. And he's um, he's really the eminence grise of, of Algerian historians. And I've known him for 25 years. Um, and he and Fanon sparred over, um, for example, over the question of the peasantry. You know, Fanon was a great believer in the revolutionary potential of the peasantry. That was perhaps Fanon at his most romantic and and, and at his least reliable. Um, another important uh, figure in this book is Mouloud Faraoun, who was a Kabyl school teacher and novelist um, who did not know Fanon, um, but who was really the great witness of the Algerian a war of independence. In some ways, he was like the the victor clemperer of the Algerian war, and his his diaries um, are an extremely powerful account of what life was like from day to day uh, for people um, uh, people, uh, particularly for the Berbers of of, of Kabylia. Um, I also wanted to bring back some of the women whom Fanon tended to ignore in his writings, notably Suzanne Césaire, the wife of Aimé Césaire, who was, I think, arguably just as original and distinctive as her much more famous husband, and whose essays on the psychological effects of colonialism prefigured Fanon's, much more so than Césaire's poetry or even his discourse on colonialism. And then, of course, Simone de Beauvoir, whom uh, Fanon read, but whom he never credited, and whom he eventually, of course, meets in Rome with Sartre and takes really no interest in her. 
but they're part of these conversations. And so too are people who um, didn't really cross paths with Fanon, but who were, but whose ideas were very much part of the milieu and the ambiance of these struggles. Um, Richard Wright was one. Fanon, as I mentioned, was a was an was a passionate reader of Richard Wright's work, which he discovered in translation in late Tom Modern, the late nineteen forties. He often um, made reference to them. He wanted to write a study of Richard Wright's work, and in fact wrote him a letter in nineteen fifty three announcing his intention to write a monograph. Richard Wright never replied, and then several years later, uh, Fanon, um, uh, under you know, without um, wrote an anonymous article in the Algerian newspaper Le Mujahid. Uh, denouncing uh, Richard Wright's book on um, on independence struggles in Africa, um, and and then of course there's Camus. You know, uh, Fanon did not know Camus. Uh, Camus is only mentioned once in Fanon's writing, and it's not under Fanon's own name. It's uh, it's the appendix uh, to A Dying Colonialism, written by one of Fanon's interns, and uh, uh, Camus and Fanon would have would have hated each other. Um, uh, but yes, definitely, but you can see, but you, but what's fascinating about Camus' novel, um, The First Man, Le Premier Homme, which was his great unfinished novel about his childhood, is that he was allowing himself to say things in fiction, which he refused to say in his political writings about the, the dignity of the Algerian struggle. Um, and, uh, so I try to, you know, even though I'm quite critical of Fanon in some ways in this book, I try to give him a, a proper burial. Um, he was someone who was very much a, a captive of his, of his own era, which he could not see beyond. Uh, Fanon was a much more insurgent thinker with his own flaws, which were different. But my purpose was to, th was to, um, help to throw Fanon into bold relief by juxtaposing him with these other thinkers, these other witnesses, uh, some of whom he knew, some of whom he, you know, um, might have crossed paths with, might not have. We're pretty much at time, um, but I'm going to end us with one question. And it's, you know, you said, what comes after? And that's a question you continually ask through the Rebels Clinic. You see Fanon over and over again asking, what comes after? What comes after this indignity? What comes after this struggle? What comes after this engagement, this encounter, this alienation? What comes after the solitude? And one of the poignant um, you know, threads running through the book was the sense of solitude you, know, you see coming from you know, Fanon you know, in, in the midst of all of that you know, solidarity and his you know, push for solidarity and his expressions of solidarity. But someone has asked in the comments, um, you know, in light of the Afro-pessimism discussion, you know, you know, could you discuss Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism related to Fanon? And so, you know, I'd love to hear your reflections on that because one of the things that you're continually thinking about in this book, um, in the Rebels Clinic, is the future. You know, you know how you know how to think of the future, and the future is hovering over, you know, in a Fanon, but hovering over chapter after chapter in this book. You know, you know what next? You know, you know where do we go from here? And so. Would you discuss sure, in, sure, future, I mean, in light of that? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd love to imagine that there's some relationship between a figure like Fanon and um, some of the Afro, I mean, broad, I mean, Afrofuturism, of course, is a contemporary term. I think Mark Deary was the person who invented it in the 90s. Um, the Afrofuturism would have meant nothing to Fanon. Um, uh, but I'd like to imagine that um, Fanon would have affinities with figures like um, Sun Ra and 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 George Clinton, um, uh, not to mention you know uh, Octavio, Octavio Butler or you know the Alice Coltrane, um, but you know the historical Fanon, um, you know I'm not sure that he would have really grasped Afrofuturism as a as a cultural formation because. You know, Fanon's own view of culture was that it was something forged in the heat of battle, in political struggle. When I say this, by the way, I'm not endorsing Fanon's idea. I think it's a, you know, it's quite an instrumental view of culture. Um, I mean, Fanon was divided. On the one hand, as a man, he was drawn to musical modernism, 
he wrote um, very admiringly of bebop and contrasted it favorably to older forms of jazz, which conservative white critics continued to champion as the authentic jazz. It's actually a, a critique of jazz criticism that prefigured Amiri Baraka's writings in in his in his great book um, uh, Blue People. Um, but Fanon later settles on a kind of more instrumental view of culture as something that is produced in struggle and that has almost no relationship to um, to the past. It's something that is purely future oriented. I don't think that's true of most Afrofuturism. I mean, Afrofuturism often projects this future in which various temporalities collide and overlap. So in Sun Ra's music, you know, we're hearing doo-wop, we're hearing the blues, we're hearing flashes of classical music, we're hearing avant-garde jazz. It's a very, I think, a very different kind of vision um, than, than Fanon had. That said, um, I think you could see Fanon with his vision of planetary rebellion, with his vision of overcoming injustice and also overcoming racism and even overcoming race as an exemplary political Afrofuturist. I'd like to believe that. Um, whether Fanon would have recognized himself in those terms is a question we can only speculate on. But one thing's for sure, we can recognize you know, a rich, um, capacious, complex, a multitudinous portrait of Fanon in the Rebels Clinic. So thank you so much for that book, Adam. That book, by the way, which is available uh, in a, from City Lights, the links are there, not merely that book, but books of a variety of other thinkers that we've mentioned tonight. And of course, you know, Fanon's own books. So thank you all for spending your evening, those on the West Coast, your night, um, those here in the East Coast and elsewhere with us. And Adam, congratulations on a wonderful book. And and I encourage you all to go grab that book and grab the many other wonderful, um, you know, thoughtful, delightful, beautiful books that are available at City Lights. City Lights, thank you so much for hosting us. And once again, thank you all. And thank you, City Lights. And thank you so much, Garnett Cadigan, a writer I immensely admire. And it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Adam. Well, thank you both for gracing our virtual halls. It's so great to have you both back in our orbit, especially in exploring if you're really as compelling as Fanon. So really appreciate it. I'd like to remind everyone we have posted links with which you may purchase copies of the Rebels Clinic and other books. Uh, better yet, if you're in the neighborhood, come on down, browse our stacks. We're located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Do visit. We'd love to see you. We also have a full selection of Franz Fanon books in print. So when you're curiosity has been sufficiently inspired by the Rebels Clinic, come on down and immerse yourself. Today's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, furthering the legacy of our founder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into the future. So, so long, everyone. Take care. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you all.